Okay, brethren. Um, I thought long hard about how to speak on a topic that I have actually had the opportunity to speak many times on before. I've spoken about God's glory, glory in regards of its, his power. I've spoken about it in regards of his presence. I spoke about it in regards of why it is it is important that in everything we do, we give glory to God. And when I thought about how I could bring something new to this topic, what was impressed on my heart was maybe sharing with you, with you a little bit of my own personal experience and what God has done for me and how as a result of me thinking about this topic and um, wondering how best I can share with you why I have the kind of appreciation that I'm growing to have. Because every time I think that I have seen, I can see of God, he shows me more of himself. He gets more beautiful to me every day. And I hope that when I share my testimony, which is something I'm going to do, and I think it fits well, David, with where the Spirit has led this evening in regards to us all having an opportunity to share a little bit of ourselves in terms of how God has led us. I hope that we won't be shy about it. It is important that we share with each other how God has led us. I think there's a blessing for us in those testimonies. So I'll start a little bit by how I think Paul did it. David speaks all the time about, Brother David that is, um, of his love of Paul. And I have grown to have a real appreciation for Paul. I, I can't say that my appreciate from, appreciation of Paul is much more than my appreciation for John because there's something about the way in which John writes that really touches me in a personal way. I find that Paul deals with things uh, on a very theological level, but John makes it very personal. And I'm going to be using both of these authors, both of these men of God quite a bit, particularly as I, as I make this presentation. But Paul starts out in the book of Galatians, which it is my understanding is his first letter. That's it. He writes this letter on his, at the end or towards the end of his first missionary journey, according to those who would know. And in it, he says something that I think is instructive. He says in Galatians 1, verse 6 through 9, I marvel that ye are so soon moved from him that is called into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have preached, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have received, let him be accursed. I've come to appreciate why this is so true. It is the same author who says in Romans 1 verse 16, that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. Believe what? The whole truth. Not part of it, but the whole truth. There is something about the whole truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why he refers to it in this way. And I hope as I share my testimony, you will be better be able to appreciate why it is the whole truth that will finish what has been started 2,000 years ago. And even though a major part of what Christ has accomplished has already been done, and we have something to sink our faith into it in regards to what he has accomplished on the cross, there is still something before us that is incredibly important that we must understand. And I'm afraid that 
God's people have been very lacking in their understanding here. Satan has been very successful in keeping us from seeing this clearly. And it's part of the reason I believe why we're still here today, why the work is not yet done. I think it is important that we recognize that being saved is the beginning of the road. It's not the end of the road, it is the beginning. At the very beginning, Christ saves us. For the very purpose, I think, of moving self out of the way. Because when I think of it, if he had not saved us at the very beginning, what we find, what I found in my own personal relationship with the Lord for the majority of the time that I have been walking with Christ, and I've been walking with him for almost 30 years, is that if we can't see clearly that this is the beginning, then we spend a lot of our time focused on self, focused on trying to make sure that we are saved, which keeps us from being and doing that which is God's will for us in Christ. You know, I don't know how else to look at these verses when I read them in terms of this truth. And I've not understood this for a long time. I've only understood this for about two to three years now. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 9 to 10, Paul writing to Timothy puts it this way. He says, he has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according as is to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This very gospel that Paul insists that we should have none other of any other, for there is no other gospel. John puts it in a way that I also can't deny. He says in John 5, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, well, Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Not will have in the future. Not might have in the future, but have everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from life unto, from death unto life. For me, that is true. It has come to be true. It wasn't always true. Titus puts it this way. Well, Paul in his letter to Titus anyway. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Past tense. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly to Jesus Christ our Savior. It's all front loaded. We are saved by faith when we believe in Jesus Christ. You know, my mind comes back to Paul as Peter, as he's preaching at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit is poured out in great power and convicts the hearts of the men. Some of who I can imagine may have been among those who stood there saying, crucify him, crucify him. And they turn to ask, how might we be saved? And Peter say, confess your sins. Get baptized. And you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Now, 
if the Holy Spirit is the presence of God and if God's glory is in his presence, what has happened to an individual who has received the Holy Spirit? What state is he then now in? He's in a saved state. I've tried to share this truth with many people that I care very deeply for. And I've had a really hard time. It's not an issue I have found of showing them it in the scripture. I found that it is it takes more than just showing it in the scripture. It takes the convicting of the Holy Spirit in the heart to really bring across the beauty of what God has done in Christ for us. It's hard for me to talk about it without getting emotional. It's hard. When I was 23 years old, I was at a place in my life where I finally made the decision to give my life to the Lord. As I look back at it, no, it wasn't so much because I had fallen in love with Christ, but more because I had come to a recognition that what I was doing for the last four years of my life was not working. I had thought for a long time that when I had an opportunity to leave my parents' home and to go out into the world and live my life, that I would find in it everything I was looking for. And I'd gone to the place where I realized that this was not true. My father was always a Christian man and when he, before he became a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, Sunday in a, as a day in my home was a day when the television was not turned on and we were not allowed um, to do any activities that the other children might be doing because for my dad it was the Sabbath. To a miracle of God, and I won't get into that because I believe it is his testimony to share when, when the time comes. Um, the Lord brought my dad to realize the, um, the Sabbath truth and he became Seventh-day Adventist. But for me, uh, that was a very unfortunate thing. You see, I had great passion for sports and I was fairly good at soccer. And I had dreams of becoming a professional footballer. One of the things that happened um, as a result of my father becoming seven Adventist is that he did not force me to go to church with him, but I could no longer participate in activities on Sabbath, which means that I couldn't play the Costa Cup anymore, which was a football competition that in Jamaica, um, would see you on your way to maybe getting a collegiate scholarship to the United States, with that, which would then be a ladder for me moving on into the professional realms of something that I really loved. And so I really did not like the Sabbath a lot. Uh, my mom was not in Jamaica at the time because her job saw her sometimes away here in the United States. And I was hopeful that when she got back, she would not choose to become an Adventist as well. But through something of another miracle, and in both cases, the Lord did something that was really miraculous in both my parents' life that saw her as well becoming Adventist, even though she resisted at first. My sisters, not long after my father become Adventist, had also chosen to do the same. And so I was the only one in the house who had not made a decision to become Adventist. So on Friday evenings, they would get together for worship and I was never forced to come to their Bible studies, but I would be in the room 
and I would hear the songs and I would hear them praying. And it was having an effect on me that I did not realize at the time. From time to time, I would visit um, the church with my parents, but not because I was particularly interested in what I would hear there. Um, I had other motives in mind, particularly I had, you know, I'd come to know a couple of young ladies that I liked and they went to church. So it would be a good place to have a chance to talk to them instead of just sitting down at home. Um, when I was finished with high school, I, my parents had done well enough whereby I was, a, I, was, I was allowed to come to the United States to go to school. And I completely let loose when I got here. Um, I left my home not drinking, not smoking, um, pretty much sheltered. And finding myself on my own here, I went about to enjoy the things of this world with complete abandon. And from time to time, I would see where, looking back at it now, the Lord had a plan in place. I remember one morning um, coming back from the club, I started going to the club like maybe four days a week. Uh, it was Sunday night, uh, Monday night, Saturday, Friday and Saturday nights. I was coming back from the club and I was, it was a far drive that I'd gone at night to the club. And I remember being about five miles from home. I saw the last sign on the highway and I recognized I would have been about five miles from home at this time. And I don't know when I fell asleep. I was the only one in the car. But when I woke up, I was in the exit lane, five miles away in the exit, I'm exiting off the highway. I don't know how I got there. I have no idea how. Well, I know now how. At that time, you know, I, I, I came, I was awoken and I was exiting the highway. I don't know how I got there. There's another time I was driving on the highway and I used to drive really fast and I had a tire explode and the car started spinning down the highway with hundreds of cars around and the car came to a perfect stop on the soft shoulder not hitting any car an absolute miracle and there are other stories that i won't share here but so that i might get back to what i really want to share which is what god has done in my life and how i can see the glory of god in it at about 23, um, I had not finished my schooling completely and I made a decision to go back home for spring break and visit my parents. By this, I'd gotten caught up in a wrong company. I had started to grow my hair because as far as I was concerned, the church was Babylon and all churches were Babylon. And I was starting to become Rastafarian in my mind. I'd gotten caught up with some friends who were smoking marijuana. And I had started and I found it to be something that I really liked. It actually helped with my studies, I thought, because whenever I would smoke and I would study, to me, it seems that I would even remember more. So I, I really fell in love with it. And there was not much that my mom asked me not to do. And I was very close to her. But one of the things I could remember as a child is her asking me, uh, she was not very fond of Rastas. And I thought I would cut my hair off because I was going to visit my parents. They had sent me to school and it would be disrespectful to show up with locks. And I, I would use the opportunity on the spring break to share with them um, the truths that I were finding about the history of black men in the new world and our past in the old world, which is the truth. So I got to Jamaica and I started to share with my dad about all the reasons why Rastafari was right and the church was wrong. And he listened very patiently and then he handed me a book. Uh, the book he handed me was The Great Controversy. And he says, son, I think everything that you're asking me will be answered in this book. And I remember taking the book from him, very frustrated that he would not engage with me in a conversation on it. And 
I put the book down because it was really a thick book and I had no intention of sitting down and reading the book. But I remember after that, my parents had left and gone to work. And of course I went to smoke. And by this time, the marijuana in Jamaica is somewhat stronger than the marijuana that I was smoking here. And I would get really high from smoking it. But for some reason, I found myself unable to get high. I just couldn't get high. Smoking the same thing I'd always smoked. I wasn't getting high. And I remember becoming frustrated and thinking, well, maybe I need to go and get something else. And for some reason, I, I, I was lying down in the bed and the book was there and there was a voice saying to me, read the book. And to cut a long story short, I eventually decided to read the book. I had three days before I was supposed to go back to school in the United States. And I couldn't put the book down. I read that whole book in two days. I just could not stop reading the book. You see, I have a love for history. History has always been my passion. And it is a history of God's movement in the church. And I couldn't put the book down. And I was supposed to leave on a Sunday and there was a crusade happening at the church that my father was at. And I remember the Saturday evening, um, getting ready and going into the car with my parents and the car was absolutely silent. So I'm sure they were in complete shock that I was going to go to church with them my last day in Jamaica. And I got there and the pastor, I can't tell you anything he said. All I knew is that what I was reading in that book convicted me that God was real and that if I hadn't made a decision to give him my life, that it would be a big mistake. I asked the Lord for something before I went into that water that night. I asked him, told him there was going to be two problems. I don't know how I would be able to serve him if I was still smoking. And that it was something I loved too much to stop smoking. And I didn't know how I was going to handle um, not having more than one girlfriend. Because, you know, that would have, was going to be a challenge for me. <laughs> And I got into that water and I came out that night and I just did not have a desire to smoke anymore. I can't explain it other than to say it was a miracle. I also found myself completely wrapped up in spending time with God and his word. I would get up early every morning before the sun come out in the hills of Hanover and I would go up and I would take these books with me from Ellen White, not the Bible but I would have these books with, from Ellen White with me. And early in the morning, every morning, I would be up there reading the books and falling, I think, in love more with Christ. Even though when I got baptized, I don't think I was in love. I, more, I think I got baptized more out of fear than love. But not long after, particularly reading The Desire of Ages, I think I fell in love with Christ. And for five years, I did not come back to the United States. I decided that I was not going to go back to school. Uh, my intention was to become a pastor. I was going to go to Westerners College and become a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Didn't have a girlfriend again for five years. I don't even think I, hold, I held a girl's hand for five years, which was somewhat of a miracle as well, considering my lifestyle for the previous three years before I got baptized. But unfortunately, um, it didn't continue. Something happened in my life, and I won't go into it here, but I became really angry with God over it. And I started smoking again. Well, not smoking first. I started um, having relationships. Um, with more than one female again, which made me feel really bad about myself. And then I would smoke to forget what I was doing. And so I found myself back at ground zero after five years. What I've come to learn in that experience is that the gospel as it is preached in denominational Christianity, and I would say this about all the denominations for the most part 
It has the ability to bring you to Christ. But it does not have the ability to change you into the image of the Son of God. So you might hear the gospel in the Adventist church, or you might hear it in the Baptist church, or you might even hear it in the Catholic church, because all it really takes to come into a saving relationship with Christ is to believe Jesus is God's son and to give him your life. But that again is just the beginning of the road. It takes the everlasting gospel, the complete gospel, to grow you up into the fullness of the stature of a son of God. And so I spent the next 15 years of my life um, fluctuating um, and having great struggles. Um, I didn't continue to be promiscuous for very long because it wasn't much, maybe a couple of years later, I met my wife who was a wonderful woman and I fell completely in love with her. And I have not looked left or right since, which I'm grateful to the Lord for. Um, doctors said that I would not be able to have children and we got to praying and fasting over it, which is another story in itself. And I now have two children, even though the doctor said we would not be able to have children, which again, I'm grateful to God for. But I found myself having a hard time at the end of every Sabbath to look at myself in the mirror because I know I was living a lie. There's still things in my life that I was struggling with that I, I knew was not what God wanted for me. And when I read the scriptures, it's not what I found how a son of God should be. And so about three years ago, four years ago, excuse me, I, we had a family reunion and my sister who by this time was starting to become convinced that there was something wrong within the Seventh-day Adventist church. She asked a question at the family gathering. She asked, is there anyone here who is not a sinner? Now, I don't know anybody in my experience who has served the Lord as faithfully as my dad has served the Lord as an elder in the church. I grew up in a house with him. That man loves the Lord. I know he does. I saw him. I saw him every day, three, four o'clock in the morning. He gets up and he spends time with God two, three hours. I saw him pay not just a tithe, but a triple tithe, 30% of whatever he earned, he gave to God. And no one puts up their hand, not even my father. And I couldn't raise my hand because I know that it was still sin in my life. But it affected me deeply because I was saying, how can, how can we all be baptized member of the church as active as we all are? Something is wrong with the fact that we still are unable to say we are not sinner. You know, in the church, they taught us not to say that you're not a sinner. Well, I was taught that because it is presumptuous to say that. But in my spirit, I felt that something was wrong with this. She then asked another question. She asked, which is more important? having the word of God or having the spirit of God. Now, I'm not sure why she asked these questions. I can only tell you the, how I reacted to it. And at first for me, without even thinking, I said, it's most important that we have the word of God. Because for me, in my mind, the word of God is a light and a lamp. Without the word, how do I know how to test the spirit? You have to test these spirits, you see. So we need the word. Now I look back at that and I'm amazed at how far God has carried me because I don't believe that anymore. I now understand that the most important thing and as wonderful as God's word is, there is nothing more important than the spirit of Christ. 
nothing. And I understand that when we look out into Christianity and we look at these different denominations, you seem to have two types of church. You have churches that are word churches and the churches I would describe as word churches are, for example, the Seventh-day Adventist church, you know, the Baptist church, the Methodist church, even the Catholic church, you would call it, I would call them word churches. Then you'd have the spirit churches, the evangelicals and the Pente Pentecostals and the church of gods. And I've come to find that neither one is able to do and to finish this work that God has put before us because in reality, you need to be both. God's church, God's people need to be both. But again, I insist, more important is that we be led by the spirit of God than by the word of God. So I became convicted in my, my heart that something was wrong. And I remember going in that night and making a decision as I prayed at my bed, which is something I did a lot of times in tears because of the struggles I was having in my life and I was tired of disappointing God. And I asked him to help me to overcome it, that I don't want to live like this anymore. And I knew that something special was happening in that prayer. And I felt a lightness in my spirit. And I went to bed that night. And at about 2 a.m. in the morning, I felt an excruciating pain in my abdomen. Pain unlike any pain I've ever felt before. And I've broken my hands two times playing soccer. And I've broken, broken my foot. I know what pain is. Uh, the first time I broke my hand, it was just hanging off, hanging on by just the skin. You see, uh, I had a problem that I found out much later. There wasn't enough calcium, it seems, in my bones. I, have very, I had very brittle bones and, you know, I broke my hand really badly. And it was extremely painful. I know what pain is, let me just put it that way. But this was a pain like I've never felt before in my life. And I thought I was dying. The pain was so bad I could hardly reach over to touch my wife in the bed next to me. And I barely crawl out of bed and um, not sure what to do. My wife got up and she came over and she asked me and I could barely speak. And I told her, I just kept on saying the pain and I was groaning. And as I said, my family was here. So my wife came out and called everyone. And the pain was of such that they could not even touch me. Uh, the decision was being made to take me to the hospital, but I could not be moved because the pain was beyond anything I can explain to you in words. And I thought for a minute that maybe it was my appendix, but then it was on the wrong side of my body. It was not my appendix. And it was not getting any better. It felt like my intestines were being, a hand was wrapped inside of me and pulling my intestines out. Something in my heart said to me that I was under a demonic attack. And so I could barely get it out and I asked the family to start praying. And I remember uh, everyone got down and started to pray and all I could say was Jesus. I could barely say it, but in through the groanings of the pain, I, I groaned Jesus. And not long after that, the pain went away. I know that night that the decision that I had made and the atmosphere that was in my life, I don't want to go into what it is that I was struggling because it is something that I am ashamed of. And maybe one day I will talk about it. And I have used it at other times as a witness uh, when speaking to individuals, but I, I don't feel the freedom right now to discuss that in this group. Uh, I hope you guys are okay with that. But it was something that had seen me in a really bad place. I can look back now and realize that I was really on some really dangerous ground. And so that attack that happened that night based on the decision that I had made was a reaction to the decision that I had made. Now, I have not had that attack ever again since. And not long after that, and I need to rush my testimony a little bit now, I have to skip some stuff because there is something really important that I want to share. Um, in God's word about his glory that I've come to understand that I need to have the time to. I, I, I started spending a little bit more time in God's word. 
no longer in the writings of Ellen White. And I've not disavowed Ellen White, but to be honest with you, I, I don't read her writings anymore. And I, 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 it's not because I don't believe it, that her writings have not been helpful to me. I believe they have been helpful to me. Uh, it was the great controversy that convicted me that I needed to give my life to the Lord. And I read The Desire of Ages, and I think I started to fall in love with Christ after reading that book. But I started spending a lot more time in the Bible, and I was seeing things that I had never seen before. And then the question of the Trinity came up. And I was confronted when I started to study the history of the Adventist church that this was not a part, was not part of the platform that God had given to the church. Recognize that the Trinity doctrine didn't come into the church until officially around 1980. I had a chance to look at the history of how it developed and the players that were involved. I had a chance to spend some time um, understanding that this was not truth and that something was being kept from Seventh-day Adventists in regards to this. And so I decided to ask the pastor at my church about it. And I was shocked at his reaction. He told me he would go and take a look at it and get back to me. But instead, there was a meeting called. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with how this goes. But God was gracious, was grace, was more than gracious in my situation. And the members of the board um, decided that the questions that I were asking were not enough to allow me to stop speaking in the church. And I'm still allowed to speak at my church today, even though I am sometimes amazed that I am because the things that I am saying are quite a contrast to what the church's position is. But so far, the Lord has allowed me the opportunity to continue to speak. And so as long as I, they allow me to speak, I will continue to do so. But when that understanding came, I started searching the internet and then I found David. Um, David, I started to watch his videos and I started to realize that there was more at play here than just a problem with the Trinity doctrine. I became confronted with things that I could no longer deny as being true. And so I just want to take a quick look through some of the things that I found. I found as a result of the Trinity that the Holy Spirit is the actual life of the Father and the Son in us. And I recognized what that represent, represented, what that meant. It then changed my understanding of what sanctification and justification is. Sanctification could no longer for me be the work of a lifetime. It was an event that happened not long after justification takes place. I recognize that both these things happen as a result of the blood of Christ. And I recognize also that it's the spirit of Christ that is also involved in my justification and sanctification. I would spend the time and quote the verses, but you guys are more than familiar with a lot of these verses. I then came to realize that this life of Christ that is in me, made him uh, made isaiah 9 verse 6 make sense when it says that jesus was to be the everlasting father i then understood how he became the everlasting father where in first corinthians 15 it says that he was made a life-given spirit and this life i have from me is a new life i am a new creation with the second adam being the father of this new race of beings that has been created in god's son I came to an understanding of the fact that as a result of receiving the life of Christ, I am already in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, yet even though it is physically in terms of its finished work and our life completed in it has not yet happened and will not happen until Jesus Christ return, that I am already translated into the kingdom of God based on, on this life of Christ that I have in me. I realized that sin, most importantly, is something that has been defeated. 
and that has no longer dominion over me as a son of God. And even though there might be things in my flesh that I still struggle with, I understand very clearly that the ministration of Christ and the Holy Spirit that sees me every day, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, being renewed in my spirit man, is a ministry that is continuous as long as I am in Christ. You see, as a result of this now, 1 John 3, verse 6 and verse 9, which were verses that I could never understand and were always confusing to me. How it is that a man that is born of God cannot sin? Couldn't understand that verse before, you know? And the reason we cannot sin is because his seed remaineth in us. Now it all makes sense. I find in 1 John 5, I believe it is verse 16 and 17, that there is a sin that causes separation from God and a sin that does not cause separation. And so my understanding in terms of what Paul was speaking about when he says that if there is any other gospel, and that there is to be no other gospel because there is no other gospel. And all the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe because I am not who I was anymore as a result of these truths. I have all the confidence in the world of who I am as a son of God. I know now that as a son of God, I'm being led by the spirit of God and it means everything to me. If I was in love with Jesus before, I don't know what to call what I am with him now. He is my all, he is my everything. I, I, <laughs> I wish I had the words. I've come to find that the law, which I found the hardest thing to share with people I love and I care about who are still in the Adventist church, like my dad. You know, he has come to appreciate the truth about the Trinity. He's come to appreciate the truth about sanctification. He's come to appreciate the truth about the life of Christ. But the one thing I cannot get through to him on is the purpose of the law. And it makes sense to me why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, that it's the laws of Moses that prevents people from seeing Christ. You can understand it now. But my experience has been as such that even as I sit and I listen to David and I listen to Howard and I listen to Imad and Adir, particularly those four men, I've learned quite a bit. Enough that I am in a position now with a group here in Fort Lauderdale that the Lord has allowed me to lead out in, in many classes. And I believe he has been blessing the ministry that we have been a part of. And I'm grateful, but I want to do more because there's a lot more to be done. I find that he wakes me up sometimes and he shows me things in the scripture that I've never heard anyone speak on before as well. Two weeks before Howard spoke on what it means when he says, he spoke about John chapter 14 and how, you know, um, Jesus is going to prepare mansions for us in his house. Um, the Lord had already impressed upon my mind that he wasn't speaking about the houses that we are to live in or where we are going to live when Jesus returns. But that what Jesus was going to do when he says he was going to prepare a place for us, he was speaking about the place we now have as we live with him in his spirit. I see over and over in the scripture where the people of God are described as a building. I see in 1 Corinthians where he speaks about us all partaking of this work on this building of God. I know every man will be rewarding a cause as his work is on this building. He also has spoken to me about the seal of God, something that I have never heard before. And I think it is important to what I'm going to say to close. I saw where 
for me, there has been four seals of God. And my understanding of these four seals have a lot to do with a teaching that David had presented some time ago about the fact that man has three parts, his body, soul, and spirit. I find that the first seal that was given to man was a seal that was given in the flesh. It's the seal that Paul speaks about that was given to Abraham in his flesh because the seal could not yet be given to him in the spirit. I'm going to read the scripture here for a little bit because I think it is important that you guys take a look at this to see if you see any light in it. In Romans 4, verse 9 and 11, um, Paul commenting on it says this. Commit this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised so it speaks of this covenanted relationship of faith between god and abraham that we find in i believe it is galatians chapter 3 paul speaking about as being the superior covenant you know he speaks there about this covenant with abraham being 430 years before the covenant with Moses and how it is the covenant of Abraham that is the everlasting covenant. But I digress. More importantly for what I'm saying here, the Bible speaks of this fate of Abraham being a seal that was placed in his flesh based on the act of circumcision that was to come upon all the people of God. I find then that there is another seal, and, and I, I, I don't know if this seal I should I should speak to as much because it is more a seal that I find in the law, in the covenant with, with Moses, where we find the, the Sabbath being spoken about in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, where he says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. But more importantly, it's the third seal that I find in the Bible, the seal of the Spirit. In John 3, verse 5 and 6, he says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So the new birth is a spiritual birth. And in receiving the life of Christ, the spirit of Christ, which the Bible says in Galatians 4, verse 6, because your sons, God has put forth the spirit of his son into your heart. The Bible says something about the spirit of the son that is in our hearts. In Ephesians 1, verse 13, it says this, in whom also he trusted after he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after he believed, he was sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So that's, that is also a seal. It's a seal in our spirit man. So first seal in the flesh, why? Because we can't be sealed in the spirit yet. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was not given, John 7, verse 38 and 39, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. But upon the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the receiving of the life of Christ, we are now sons of God. And we now have a seal, the seal of Christ. You know, in John 6, verse 27 and 28, Jesus went speaking to the people as he had done feeding them and they were trying to make him king by force. He goes off into the mountains and he sends his disciples over to Capernaum. And the multitude are waiting on him to come down and they don't see him come down. Jesus ends up getting to Capernaum in a miracle. You know, the disciples see him walking in, in on the water and he steps into the boat and immediately they're at land, you know. And the people come across and they see Jesus and they want to inquire how he get here, how he has gotten there because they saw him go up into the mountain. He doesn't speak to them on that. He says something to them that I find absolutely fascinating. At least I find the whole book of John 6 to be one of the most beautiful pieces of scripture in the entire Bible. But he says there that the bread of life, which he would give them, 
they should not worry about the bread of and the things of this world and 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 he makes a statement there about himself he says for i am he speaks of himself as being he whom god the father had sealed i think it's verse 27 or verse 28 so we see jesus speaking of himself as being sealed and we see the holy spirit being the seal of god that we have received in our spirit so it's christ himself and again it's another connection that i think it's hard to deny when you look at it the relationship between jesus christ and the holy spirit but more importantly that which i would want to spend the last few moments of my my time on is the last seal the seal we find that the 144,000 get for me this is a seal of the soul these individuals arrive at a place where the Bible says there is no guile in them. They're perfect before God. And in this perfect state, they receive a seal. And for me, that seal is the seal on the soul. You see, whereas we receive the Holy Spirit now, and it is sealing us in the spirit man, we can lose our salvation. I don't believe at all in one save, always save. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 6. Well, yes. And Hebrews 10, I think it is verse 26 to 29, that those who have come into an understanding of the great truths of God and lose their way in Christ. If they fall out of Christ, there is no way for them to again be saved. So I find that we can lose that, sol that salvation. We can, even though we have been sealed in our spirit, still lose salvation. But the soul, the seal in the soul, the seal of the 144,000, it's a whole different thing. It's a final seal, sealed into perfection forever. And there's a reason for that. I started out saying that I wanted to be able to look at the glory of God from a place where I had not looked at it before. And as I was speaking to the Lord about it, and I'm winding down now, he took me to John chapter 17. And I saw something there that I'd never seen before. I'd looked at this chapter many times in the past, but it says something there about the glory of God that I think speaks to the experience that I've had and God's faithfulness and long suffering with me in not letting go of me when there was in my mind a lot of reasons to. It's the very reason why a lot of us are sitting here today. I'm sure a lot of you are able to, if you really think about it, think of times where God might have let go of you. In John 17, verse one to five, Jesus speaks to the Father and he says this. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. That thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God. I am Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self of the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In verse 17 through 19, he says this, and continuing, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. <laughs> he follows this up in verse 22, 26 by saying this. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou givest me, I have 
given them. The glory which thou givest me, I have given them. Sorry about that. that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one. And the world might know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, as thou hast loved them. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world had not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. And here it goes, brethren, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. You see, when I thought about what I should call my little presentation and how I would see the glory of God from another angle. What I found is the glory of God's love. Glory of God's love. You know, Jesus speaks here about receiving glory from the Father that he might give us this glory and its purpose is that we might know love. So an angle that I've never thought about glory about from before. But it has come to make a lot of sense to me because now I understand a little bit better when the Bible says that we're going from glory to glory. I understand why it is that for the last 2000 years we're still here even though we receive and we are saved in Christ and a part of the kingdom of God in his son just based on our faith. Why, for another 2,000 years, we are here? The answer for that I found in Ephesians chapter 3. You see, in Ephesians, Peter, Paul spends some time speaking about this mystery of Christ and that the fact that he has been called to be a minister of this mystery of Christ. And he's to say in verse 10, something about the mystery of Christ and its intention and what the plan of salvation is in revealing this mystery unto men. Mm -hmm. And he says something about this mystery. It is not something that you can find by searching for it. It is something that is spiritual that God has to give us in the spirit. It is something that is to be spiritually understood because God does not cast his pearls before swine. The great principles of the gospel and what God has accomplished in his son are for those who have grown up in the spirit of the son of God. That's what has happened to the 144,000 that sees them in the condition that they're in. And it is the great truth that I find that is missing in Christianity, an understanding of what glorification is. The change of character, making us like Christ is. And he says in verse 10 what that purpose is. That principalities and powers might know who God is as they look at his church. As they look at us. The vindication of God's name, my brothers and sisters, is the reason why we're still here. But this wonderful truth of the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this, this part, glorification, has been hidden away from the majority of Christians for hundreds of years. It is the truth about what happens when one is glorified and the process is complete that see us finishing 
the plan of salvation. Because I have come to believe that the plan of salvation primarily is not about the salvation of man by itself. It is about God revealing who he is to the entire universe. In verse 16 through 19 of Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to read it, even though I think I know it by memory, because I've spent a lot of time looking at it. But I'd like to read it in closing. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm sorry about that. It says this. Paul here is again is speaking about the mystery of Jesus Christ, which is his ministry, which is what he's called to preach, the mysteries of Christ. You know, he says he's taken up to Galatians. In Galatians, he tells us that he's taken up after his experience on the road to Damascus, three years in Arabia, and he's taught these mysteries of Christ. And he says in verse 16 about this mystery, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Think about this, brethren that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There is a work of the spirit in the inner man, a strengthening, a changing, a developing, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that he being rooted and grounded in love. I find, and I wish I had the time because they're quite, I was surprised at home with scripture that shows a relationship between God's glory and his love. Because as I said, I've spoken on this topic in our group about three to four times already, and I never noticed it before. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that he been rooted and grounded in love as a result of this glory of God that has been given to us in the inner man by the spirit of Christ. May be able to comprehend with all the saints, the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Oh Lord. <laughs> that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. So, and he ends by saying, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. So when I think of the glory of God these days, what my mind has come to in these last three days since David had asked me to, to speak on these issues, is that God's great love is the glory of God. It's what finishes the work, brethren. It is what is at work in us. And if we could but really settle into an understanding that we are saved and stop worrying about our own salvation, there's no need to worry about us anymore. Let's focus on Christ. Because as we behold him, there's a change that is taking place that will see this work finish. When we understand all the mysteries of Christ correctly and we have all the dots connected, which I think we're a far away, those people who are involved in this movement. And I feel so sad for those of our brothers and sisters who have come to realize that the Trinity doctrine is not truth, but have not gone on to the more precious things that this truth reveals. And when the dots are finished connected, God, when it is done, we will be in the state as Christ is, and the work will be done, and Christ will return. Satan has been successful in joining the church and hiding these great truths. And I'm grateful for the Reformation and what Luther did. But Luther did not finish the work. Ellen White did not finish the work. Calvin did not finish the work. None of them have finished the work. It is always to finish. It is always to finish. And it's a wonderful opportunity. These are exciting, great times. I know everything that is happening out there in the world. 
But instead of being down about it, we should be encouraged. It's not far. We are not far, brethren. It is close. Let us look to the glory of God. Let's look to his son. Let's spend time, as much time as we can with him. Because if we do that, he who has begun this work in us will finish the work. It will be over and we might finally be with Christ. Let us set to it, brethren. Let us put our minds to it. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I pray you are blessed in some way in what I have said. Amen. 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 Very good.